The full name is Gert Friedrich Franz Schmitz. And I remember on September the 1st, 1939, Hitler was, was on the radio telling that the war started. Since five o'clock this morning, our troops marching into Poland, doing whatever they do best. Six months later, Hitler marched into the France. The British came and the Americans came into the war. And I talked to my grandpa and he, he told me, he said, if they, if they want to win the war, they said, don't look too good. He said, don't say that, grandpa, we cannot lose the war. That was not even remotely in my mind that we ever could lose the war, you know, because we were so conditioned politically. Hitler uh, controlled the, the newspapers, they controlled the radio, and Goebbels, the, the propaganda minister, he controlled everything else. And we listened to the news and, and they told us all about going on in the Western Front and how successful they are and all that. And then we walked outside and we heard the guns. And you say, well, that is too close for what they tell us where they're supposed to be. Following their defeat in the First World War, Germany was reeling from the harsh conditions of a peace treaty that left the country shamed and buried in economic crisis. But in 1933, when a radical new leader rose to power, promising to restore Germany and place it at the forefront of world powers, the people were captivated. Adolf Hitler's reign brought swift economic relief, and the German military was quickly on the rise. But his radical political party enforced totalitarianism over the government and the public, making Nazism synonymous with the German way of life. They had everything organized. You couldn't get lost or to fall through the cracks. You know, there were no cracks. <laughs> you, were, you were part of it if you liked it or not. I got drafted into the Hitler Youth when I was 10 years old. And they gave us a uniform and all that, you know. Like thousands of other German boys, Gert Schmitz was swept up in the Hitler Youth. But the draft was not without its benefits. Upon graduation, Gert was offered the opportunity to fly with the Luftwaffe. They said, do you want to go to a jet pilot training school? We have one in Fulda, Germany. And you go over there and you, you start training for a flying Messerschmitt 262 jets. He said, shoot, yeah. But before he would reach the airfield, the Allied bombing campaign would reach it first. And when I got up there, the hangars were bombed, the runways were bombed, the airplanes were bombed. And there, there was nothing left for us to do. And they said, well, we'll temporarily assign you to a paratrooper outfit and send you to the Western Front. So we got on the train that afternoon. We, we ended up in Pazavar. We talked to the neighbor, the, the people, the local people there. They heard on the news that the Russians had just come from the south, from the east and south, and cut off that air base where we were. I mean, that was bad news. Gert may have escaped capture by the Russians, but now he was headed to the Western Front, where the British and Americans were on the advance, and the German army was in disarray. That was chaos. The whole German armed forces was in total chaos. We didn't know where they were, I don't know where the headquarters were, you didn't know where the real front was or anything. You know, you're so busy surviving and fighting. We either won here or we lost over there and then, then go to the next. We don't know the overall picture, we have no idea what it happened. And then we finally marched into Holland. The street was open between the town and the, the woods, were the, the forest where we were supposed to go into. And it was kind of exposed, you know. And, and the Allies always flew eight fighter planes roaming in the sky. They had total sky superiority. And we had to get across that open space, and those th guys were flying around there saying, if you go in the column over there, they're serious, and they're going to mow us down. So, but if you go one guy every 100 feet, they may not even pay attention to us. So it came my time to go across, and the guy paid attention to me. 
and they came and started shooting at me. And I went into that deep ditch. And as soon as they went past me, I got out and run down toward the woods. And when I came the other way, I jumped back in the ditch. And finally got wise. Instead of going the cars, they came down alongside the ditch and just unloaded. Bullets flying behind me and in front of me. I mean, there was bullets flying in which way. So he got up and I ran and I didn't go back in the ditch. I went all the way into the woods. Yeah, that was, that was kind of nasty. But I hate mustangs to this day. <laughs> We were in Ramsdorf. That was my buddy and I. We were up at one end of town, and uh, we had a bazooka. Uh, the tank came down the street, and they started shooting. And we and we went behind those big logs there, you know, and they couldn't hit us there. He pulled that trigger, and when he hit, it said, "Woof." He got that warhead right between the tracks in the body. And he just blew the, the hell out of it, the inside. And nothing moved anymore after that. There was another tank that was up the street, and we standing in there kind of looking down the street, see what we could do. And he said, I'm going to go on the other side of the street. Because it was curved a little bit, he could see better. He said, don't go over there, that tank is up there. And while I was in the middle in the street, that tank shot one round right between his legs. I went over there and got him. The shrapnel went into his uniform and ripped his chest open. And he was sitting, he was sitting with his butt in the street. And he said, ah, ah, ah. And then it collapsed. When we marched into Ramsau first earlier, the company commanders told us, they say, you, be, you go pouring to make sure everything is all right. And way later on, after we were supposed to move out, they said, man, we probably went pouring again. You know, we the first one out there. And the company commander said, they said you, you're the rear guard. So they said, no, you don't want to be on the rear on the, on the way out. You want to be front. But anyway, there was an open field and they wanted to march into the woods. And what we were way behind as a rear guard, they walked into a trap. The, the Americans, they already were on three sides and they waited till the whole battalion marched in there and they mowed them down. So the four of us, we went off to the right into the woods and disappeared in the woods. And that's how we ended up behind enemy lines. Gert and his three comrades were on their own, disoriented and desperately searching for ever elusive friendly territory. And then when we finally got into Dulman, it was daylight and there was a six foot fence, a chain link fence. They said, that must be a park. Nobody is fighting in the park, so we're gonna be pretty safe. So we got over and I climbed over that six foot fence. GIs walking all over the place there. And they saw us and they started shooting at us. They had a deuce and a half truck with machine guns on there. They came around and started shooting at us with that. And then we said, we got to get out of this park. So we jumped over the fence. Then there was tanks on the outside. They said, that ain't not safe either. Let's jump back in the fence. We jumped back over that six foot fence. And then that truck came and started shooting it up. We went back over the fence again and went in the other direction. And we saw a pine forest over there. And they said, let's get into that forest and get the heck out of here. And we, we, we crawled on, on our stomach and we finally got into the woods and they came after us. And they said, well, let's hide behind the trees till they go. And they, if they don't see us, they might go away. And they came and I stood behind that tree. You know, we all stood behind each one of, one of those trees. It was just big enough to hide us. 
And they said, what I'm going to do, you know, if we can't run, they're going to start shooting at us. And I finally, I, I, I put my hand on and waved, you know, say, hi. <laughs> and they said, come on out, come on out, you know, hands up, hands up. And that's how we got captured. Now in American custody, intended for relocation to a POW camp in the United States, Gert began the long journey across Europe. From prison camp to prison camp, he passed the time by drawing pictures to document his experiences. But before Gert would reach the French coast, Germany surrendered, the war came to an end, and the prisoners were sent back to their homes. The Germany Gert returned to was very different than he remembered. Hitler was gone, the Nazi party dissolved, and Gert himself had acquired a fresh perspective. I didn't realize how bad it was, but then after the war, everything came democratic, you know, and, and, and peaceful. And they said, wait a minute, that's a hell of a lot different than what we went through all that, you know. I didn't know about the full extent of the concentration camp because that was kept so well secret, you know, that we heard about it, you know, but they said that's where murderers go in and, and wife beaters, you know, and they, they, they rehabilitate, supposed to be rehabilitated. But they didn't do that. And I didn't know the full extent till I, till I came to the United States. Following the war, Gert immigrated to the U.S., served with the Army, and went on to a career in aerospace engineering, working alongside Werner von Braun. Gert served his country honorably in the Second World War, but like all of those who survived, regardless of what side, he hopes to one day live in a world free of violent conflict. War is the, the, the stupidest thing that man invented. If you can't talk it out, if you, can, if you cannot communicate, you start fighting. You have to do away with your problem. You have to annihilate your problem. But that is not a solution. You know, that's, that just create more problems. Don't fight, talk it out. There got to be a solution. There is always a solution. Hey everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II, and I just want to say thank you for watching this episode and also give you an opportunity to join up with what we're doing. We're dedicated to reaching as many veterans of the Second World War as we can, both here in the U.S. and across the world, but we're running out of time. The youngest World War II veterans are in their 90s, and every day we're losing more and more of them. So here are three simple ways that you can join with us. First, consider supporting us through Patreon. Patreon is a subscription-based service that keeps projects like this one going. Second, you can share these videos with your family and friends. It's a great way to honor these veterans and get these stories out there. And finally, consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks again for your support and thank you for watching.